Let's look at the subject of subroutines. Subroutines weren't really part of original mumps. Sort of, but not exactly. Uh, back in those days, in the mid-60s, BASIC had a, a command called GoSub, which wasn't really a subroutine command. What it was was a command to go to a different part of the program, execute the code there, then return. Sounds like a subroutine, but it isn't. The symbol table was all the same. This was just regular code. It wasn't particularly isolated or anything like that. Well, Mumps adopted the same idea. The original version of um, subroutines, so to speak, was with the do command. And as you can see down here, do some label. And what that would cause the system to do is that it would branch to that label, execute the code, until it either got to the end of the program or hit a quit. When it hit the quit or end of the program, it would return to the invoking do. There were no, sub there were no parameters passed. Uh, there were no uh, results returned. Any, re any parameters passed were already in the symbol table, available as variables. Any changes that that area of code made were be would be changes to the symbol table to variables, which would be visible when you got back to the invoking do. It was all the same symbol table. So if something was known prior to the do, it was known in the code that was invoked by the do. There was a variant on that where you could call a program off of disk. And it, you can see in the second example, example here, it has an up arrow in front of the file name. And that means to bring the file in, execute it, and return back to the invoking do. Now the file, when it comes in, <clears throat> gets the same symbol table. Any changes it makes to variables are known when the return is made. It's not a return, it's quit. Uh, so that was, that was the way it was done. And most code that you see out there, including the VA code, is actually written that way. Then they started changing it in order to make it more consistent with uh, modern programming languages where you were passing parameters and re receiving results back. The simplest form here is that you said do and you gave it a label and you would pass parameters. All right. Um, also, you could say do with a file name and pass parameters. Now, the passing of parameters it can either be by name or, um, or by value. This is by value. Uh, uh, in both cases, however, the symbol table is still the same. Um, so anything modified in the symbol table of a variable that existed prior to the do will be seen on return. Any variables created in the block of code invoked will be seen upon return. Uh, the only things where you get around that is if you have a new command which cr in, the, in the subroutine area, I should call it an area because it's not really separate code, uh, in the subroutine area, you, if you have the new command, you create some variables, they will be destroyed on exit. Um, any, any parameters that were passed, if they have different names in the subroutine, modifications to those parameters will uh, disappear when you exit if they are called by value. If they're called by name, any changes, of course, are changing to the original parameters, whatever they have, may have been called back in the invoking section. So anyway, that sounds confusing enough. It's um, In reality, um, I think most people use the original style more than anything. Um, here's an example of the original style. And if you want to play with this on your own program, be sure to put a halt or something down here. Now we have a block of code. Well, go through it. Set i equal to 100. OK, write out 100. Perfect. Do block 1. You see the label down here, block 1. And down here, it increments i. And then you've got the quit. It's also the end of the program, which is effectively a quit. It would return back to the to the do. When I write out I on the next line, it will write out, uh, well, it's not going to write out, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to write out 200. I thought I misread that as a 1. Okay, it's going to write out 200, I plus I, in the subroutine. And then you halt. If you didn't have the halt here, it would continue executing, and it would actually execute um uh, the the subroutine again. There's no no barrier to entry. And in some of these things, you make you want to make sure you do put the halt in if you're playing with it, uh, because otherwise you'll enter the block of code and strange things might happen. We have some other examples. Um, for th these are examples of how to invoke by name. Uh, you put a dot in front of the variable name. Dot a dot b dot c doesn't have, they don't all have to be by name. Uh, um, that means any changes to the receiving parameter will be reflected back in the in the invoking program. Um, it's a little out of place here. We should probably talk about that later. Uh, here's another example. Um, do two. Um, we go down there. We modify x and we return back up here. Um, presumably x had. Um, 
Um, the X did not exist, okay? And when we, when we do the 2, there's the label 2, uh, X at this point presumably did not exist. When we enter the subroutine, we do create an X, and when we return, that variable is available uh, to the calling program, uh, invoking pro area of the code. Um, if I set uh, Y equal to 99, and then I do 1, now, down, now, now here's an example of the new. And I go down to this label 1, I create a new instance of the variable X, if 1 existed. Uh, let's assume not 1 did not exist. When I... Um, I set x equal to 100. I can read, write it out, and I can write out y, which exists because it was in the calling program, and I can write out x. When I quit and I go back up here and I hit this write, the y will exist. Um, it's uh, still have um, 99 in it. But if I do a dollar sign data on x, I'll find out zero. It doesn't exist because it only existed in the subroutine because of the new command. That's where you're going to see creation and so forth. Let's see. Here's an example here where we're going to invoke with a parameter. Do 3, passing it 101. We get down here into the subroutine, and uh, we write out D. Um, that's the variable that we're receiving it in. Uh, it, we're going to get 101. Uh, when we return, notice that we'll get, uh, we'll get a 0 uh, for the dollar sign data. I'd use the abbreviation dollar sign D on D because D only existed in the subroutine. It was a parameter, and parameters will disappear uh, there when they when you return to the calling program. So we will get a zero for the dollar sign data. D does not exist in the invoking area. It only existed within the subroutine. Let's see some more examples here. I'll kill any previous value so we know there's nothing in the symbol table now. Um, we set X to 33. We call routine beginning at label 4, and we pass it dot .x, which means we're calling it by name, not by value. When we get down here, we're receiving it as z, um, and uh, we write out z, and sure enough, we get 33. If we set z equal to 44 and then go back up to the program, when we try to write out x, we'll see it's got a, the value of 44. If we also looked for the value z, we would find it did, uh, the, the variable z. It will find out it doesn't exist because it only as a name existed within the subroutine. Um, however, modifications to the parameter are reflected back in the invoking area of the code. Um, here's a little more extensive example of the new command and also nested subroutine calls. Um, if we set y equal to 99 and we invoke 1, and we go to the uh, label 1, and we have a new x. Now x is a variable, it exists. We put 100 into it, we write it out. We get 99 uh, for the value of y. We didn't pass y, but um, it it's exists, it's in the symbol table, and we'll get a value of 100 for x. Then we invoke routine 2. Uh, when we go down here, we set um, x equal to 99. When we come back to um, the area under the label 1, uh, we'll get 99 for x. x exists in routine 2. However, when we return and we go back up to the originally invoking piece of code and we go to see if x exists, it doesn't. We get a zero. So what we're, what we're saying here, x did not exist in the invoking area. Note the halt. Otherwise, it would try to execute all this with problems. Um, when we get, when we, the x does not exist up here. It ex comes into existence right here. It is in existence for anything we invoke or do until we ultimately exit this block. When we exit this block here, then x will be destroyed. But if we invoke other things, it uh, doesn't matter how many, how deep, or anything like that, um, x will exist. It's only upon return from this block in which it was created does it get destroyed. Uh, functions is a, are a variation on it. Uh, we um, We'll have in in the case of a function, uh, we're going to instead of instead of using a lab, the label name by itself, we put dollar sign dollar sign in front of it. Dollar sign normally introduces a function. Dollar sign dollar sign is for a function you wrote. So here we have um, set i equal to 100, and we're going to invoke a body of code. Uh, called sub, and we're passing it the value i. Now, the difference between a function and a uh, subroutine, one invoked by a do, is that a function can return a value. So the value returned by sub will be placed in x, and we'll write it. <coughs> so we come down to sub, we return, uh, we re receive i, we set i equal to, uh, to uh, i times 5, and we return i. 
Notice the quit has an argument. <coughs> this is the only place quit has an argument is when you're using it in a uh, in a function. So the value returned will be um, 500. And when we come back up here, when we write out x, it is 500. i, however, is 100 because the i that was in this subroutine was local to it. It was a parameter, and parameters are lost upon exit. So the i that exists inside this uh, function uh, was, a, was a different i than the one that exists back in the invoking procedure.